Go ahead and get started. I want to welcome all of you. We are grateful and excited that you have joined us today for What to Know Before You Mandate. Delta Airlines announces that all of its employees must get vaccinated or pay a $200 penalty as a healthcare uh, premium surcharge. United Airlines says we are vaccinating all employees across the board. And then of course, we've got President Biden who releases his COVID-19 action plan. And in that plan, he references an imminent ETS that's coming out by OSHA that will require all employers with 100 plus employees to either have their workforce vaccinated or they must submit to weekly COVID testing. We have a lot to talk about today. But before we do that, I want to introduce Cindy Filer. Cindy Filer is the CEO and founder of Innovative Outsourcing. Cindy, if you could give us some quick background on you and your company. Sure. Glad um, that I could be here today. Awesome that we get to share things. A lot of times um, I have, I'm an HR person and so I have limited knowledge up to this amount and then we need an H, uh, a law expert that can kind of take it from there. So it's kind of nice to have both edges of the coin here. Um, what the law says and then what employer um, HR people should do. So anyway, excited to be here. I have um, about 32 years in human resources. I was on Delta Airlines in corporate, and now I run a staffing recruiting firm and an outsourced HR firm altogether. So um, anyway, we've been doing that for about 26 years. So um, we are excited to be part of this today and hope we can get you some great information. Not that we have all the answers, but we can at least start asking some questions. Well, we appreciate you being here, Cindy. And my name is Jonathan Page. I am the Chief Visionary of In Prime Legal. In Prime Legal supports small to mid-sized businesses in five core areas of the law, one of which is labor and employment. And of course, we help those businesses build resilience to liability and get in prime legal condition. So Mallory, why don't we go ahead and fire up the PowerPoint and we will get started. So first, let's go over some house rules. All of you will be muted on this webinar. Uh, we do that intentionally so that we can get through the material. Um, if you have questions, we encourage you to pose those questions in the chat. We may not get to those questions immediately. That's likely because we plan to answer them later in the chat, but if there are any unanswered questions, our plan is to send out sort of a general FAQ at the end of the webinar um, with our answers. It may be a few days after the webinar. We won't identify anyone by person, but we'll just kind of lay out the general questions that were asked and provide some answers there as well. Um, very key, the chat room is not for political commentary. It's not for personal opinions. There are over 80 people on this webinar today. I can guarantee you that many of us have very divergent views of the vaccination policies out there, whether you should mandate, shouldn't mandate, what the CD says, CDC says, whether those are good ideas or bad ideas. That is not what today is about. We also share some common interests. And some of the common interests that we share are that we all run, operate, or own a small to mid-sized business. We all want to make sure that we have top talent and we're able to retain that top talent, that we have enough talent in order to do the technical work that needs to get done so that we can scale up our businesses and be successful. I can guarantee you all of us want our employees to be happy. We all want high morale. We all want to create an opportunity for our employees to be able to provide meaningful contributions that have meaningful, do meaningful things out there in the marketplace for our clients. Those are our common goals. So today we're going to talk about some of the legal implications that are likely around the corner, how we can successfully deal with those legal implications. We're also going to get into culture and what we can do as business owners and as C-suite executives in order to retain top talent, um, to retain a high performing team in light of what's going on out in the marketplace today and uh, the different political things that are going on as well. But again, no political commentary in the chat. Our goal is delivering value. So our plan today is to provide a value-packed webinar where you can walk away with some powerful insights, great information, and even walk away at the end of the webinar with something actionable that you can implement in your business today. And finally, fifth rule, we want to make you laugh. So this is a serious subject. We are taking it seriously. We have great information here for you today, but we've got to be able to laugh every once in a while as well. So if I can get a laugh out of you um, every once in a while, I'll have accomplished my goal. So quick roadmap, we've gotten through introductions. I will get into OSHA, COVID-19 ETS, and some other legal considerations. Then we'll move on to a fireside chat with Cindy Filer. Cindy, during the discussion I have on OSHA and COVID-19, feel free to chime in at any time. 
And then super exciting, we've got innovative, first of its kind legal software that is pre-launch. You will be some of the first to beta test it. You will actually be able to draft a COVID-19 vaccination policy and you'll be able to customize it specifically for what you want to accomplish while taking in consideration those legal implications. And that's going to be near the end of this webinar. Very excited about that. Very excited that all of you can be some of the first to beta test that. And then we'll get on to closing remarks and announcements and we'll conclude the day. So let's go ahead and start with uh, some quick background. So we're going to be talking about what President Biden has announced, but really to understand some context behind that, we really should briefly talk about OSHA, what its role is, what an ETS is, and so I'm going to do that now. 1970, President Nixon signed into law the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. That established what we know today as OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. The premise was that no worker should have to choose between their life and their job. That's important because when we get into what an ETS is, OSHA's objective is to save workers' lives, to make sure there's no hazards that are so serious that workers are ultimately losing their lives while at the workplace. So under the OSHA Act, employers must provide their workers with a workplace that does not have serious hazards, and they have to follow all of OSHA's safety and health standards. So the primary mission is a safe workplace. It covers most private sector employers in all 50 states. It either covers them through the federal OSHA or through an OSHA approved state plan. There are 22 states that have their own state run OSHA program, but it's really important to understand if you're in one of those states that the state run program must be at least as effective as the federal OSHA program. And we'll get to why that's important. So again, 22 states have done that. So what is an emergency temporary standards? That's what all the buzz is about. It's coming through what's called an emergency temporary standard. So under the OSHA Act, OSHA has the power to issue an ETS if OSHA determines that there is a grave danger that exists to workers because of some new exposure to a new hazard. So the concept or the idea behind this is if you are an agency and you were putting out a new regulation, it can take six months to three to five years in order for that new regulation to actually go into effect. So if OSHA determines that there's some new hazard that is taking workers' lives now, they don't have time to wait on that rulemaking process. The Emergency Temporary Standards, or ETS, allows them to put something into effect immediately. So as you can expect, once OSHA pu publishes that on the Federal Register, the ETS becomes effective immediately. Then it goes through the normal rulemaking process while it's in place. The concept is that eventually that ETS will become an actual permanent rule. So that's the ETS process. Now, some context here. In its 50-year history, OSHA has only issued 10 ETSs. So these are not common. Of the 10 that were issued, four of them were invalidated by the courts, and one was partially blocked. Before 2021, OSHA last issued an ETS in 1984, more than 20 years ago. They issued it to regulate asbestos exposure, it was invalidated because the court found that there was not a sufficient showing of a grave danger. Essentially, OSHA said that if they didn't put that ETS in now, 80 workers would die in the next six months. And the Court of Appeals said that wasn't sufficient. So that leads us to today. January 21st, 2021, President Biden issues an executive order. He's issued lots of executive orders, but this particular executive order simply directed OSHA to determine if an ETS would be necessary to deal with COVID-19. No one knew exactly what OSHA would do. And then six months later, June 23rd, 2021, OSHA publishes a COVID-19 ETS and sort of as a twist, it wasn't expected, they made it specific to healthcare workers and the healthcare industry. So in typical fashion, anytime the government puts out new legislation or a new regulation, what they tend to do is make it as broad as possible. Meaning they're gonna capture as many people into that regulation as possible. And then they legislate you out through exceptions or exemptions. So it's really no different with COVID-19. The grave danger that they identified here is they determined, OSHA determined for the ETS, that unvaccinated healthcare workers were at the highest risk of infection, especially those who were treating or in the same settings where patients were treated who were dealing with COVID-19 symptoms. It became effective immediately upon publication, June 21st, 2021. 
And here's where there was a lot of uh, issues is they required the employers to comply with the provisions in 14 days, most of the provisions. And then there were a few remaining provisions that they allowed the employer to comply within 30 days of the effective date. So this kind of broad reaching um, ETS apply to healthcare services and healthcare support services. So what is healthcare services? It's services provided to individuals by professional healthcare practice, practitioners for the purpose of promoting, maintaining, monitoring, and restoring health. Well, Dr. Gugolo, I know registered for this event, one of our clients um, in the healthcare space, he does men's and women's um, weight loss programs. This would arguably apply to him. It would apply to many healthcare businesses that have healthcare professionals on payroll. Healthcare support services is simply services that facilitate the provision of healthcare services. So now you're talking about IT folks and anyone that's in those settings. So again, they made it as broad as po possible to capture as many people as possible. When we get into the next ETS that's, that's imminent around the corner, it will likely be the same. And then they have these exceptions. So one of the key exceptions is that it doesn't apply to non-hospital ambulatory, meaning outpatient. So again, going back to Dr. Bubalo's practice, um, his weight loss clinic, his is all outpatient. Nobody's staying overnight, but there are some keys here. If you want the exception to apply, you have to screen all non-employees before entry and any people that are suspected of having COVID-19 are not permitted to enter. Now, screening, a lot of people are thinking temperature checks. They kind of go to these um, very, uh, what can be very difficult to implement. At a minimum, screening can simply be asking the question, you know, have you been in contact with anyone who has exhibited COVID-19 symptoms? So you'll notice if you go to your eye doctor or some of these other healthcare professionals, they were already asking this question upon entry. That would count as screening before entry. It also has an exception for pharmacists and retail settings, um, healthcare support services that are not performed in the healthcare setting, telehealth that's not in a setting where direct patient care occurs, and there's many other exceptions. Essentially what the ETS was getting at is protecting unvaccinated healthcare workers who are in settings where they are treating uh, patients who are exhibiting uh, COVID-19 symptoms. So if this does apply to you, then there's a pretty long laundry list of things that you have to do. And this is important to know because it's foreshadowing to what will likely be in the ETS that President Biden mentioned a few weeks ago. So one is you have to develop a COVID-19 plan um, you've got to limit monitor points of entry. You have to conduct employee health screenings. If you've got 10 plus employees, then you have to uh, provide paid medical removal benefits. That means the benefits they're currently receiving. My lights just went out, so I'm going to get a little dark. Uh, this is uh, some of the technicalities that we're going to be uh, dealing with during the webinar. So again, you have to be patient with us, but, uh, but it kind of gives a little Halloween theme as we're moving into October. So we're totally good with it. Um, you've got to pay for testing. That's a big thing. And we'll get into some of those costs. Uh, pay leave to receive the vaccine shot and deal with any side effects. There was a great question that was asked in the registration process. You know, what happens if uh, one of my employees gets sick from the vaccine? Do I have to pay for that? Well, uh, technically that might be considered the recovery process of obtaining the vaccine. At a minimum, you would have to pay for their leave and make sure that they're getting paid their normal wages. Whether you have to actually pay for their cost of recovery, I don't think that's been addressed, but my, my inclination would be to say no. Um, one, it wasn't like a direct injury that you received at the workplace, which would, which, which would trigger workers' compensation. It was something that was triggered outside of the work environment and it wasn't a direct cause of them working at your establishment. Um, and two, if you have, uh, if they have health insurance, the health insurance would cover it. But in most situations, you know, if they get, if they trip at the store while they're buying uh, a uniform that they need for work, you know, you wouldn't be responsible for, for that injury. So I don't believe that um, an employer would actually be responsible for paying for the cost of their health, you know, the medical cost of their benefits, but it would hit their insurance and that could have an impact on premiums and so forth. So it will have a ripple effect uh, for sure. Um, on employers. So training for COVID-19, um, there's a no retaliation provision in there. Um, can't retaliate against employees who are taking actions that are consistent with the ETS. And then there's this log that we have to establish. Now OSHA already requires a log 
for any sort of uh, incidents that happen. Um, so this is not really that different than what OSHA is requiring, but it's, it's you know, clearly going to be likely a lot more um, log entries. Uh, but that log also has to be uh, obtained, uh, maintained as well. So here we are, September 9th, 2021, President Biden releases a COVID-19 action plan. I just want to make a note here. He did not, he did not issue an executive order. He didn't issue an executive order and say, we're mandating vaccines, 100 plus employees must. He released a COVID-19 action plan. Presidents do this all the time. This is my plan. In the plan, he mentions that OSHA is working on an emergency temporary standards for private employers, and he gives some detail on what they're working on. That's not an executive order. And he doesn't need to execute an executive order for OSHA to issue the ETS. So with that understanding, um, we have what, uh, what President Biden came out with. So Mallory, if you could go to the next slide, great. So the path out of the pandemic, President Biden's COVID-19 action plan. There's not a lot in here about what this ETS will say. It basically had two things. Again, next slide, uh, Mallory, awesome. So for employers with 100 plus employees, you have to receive a COVID-19 vaccine or produce a negative COVID-19 test result at least weekly could be more frequently. And for employers with 100 plus employees must provide PTO to employees to get vaccinated um, for, uh, for the time that they take in order to obtain that vaccination appointment. That's really all his action plan said. The ETS has not been released, so we don't know the details. There was a webinar that was given by the Department of Labor. There was lots of attorneys on that webinar, lots of industry professionals, a lot of great questions asked. And the Department of Labor did give some clarification to a few things. One of those questions, for example, was this, this per work, work, work site. So if I have less than 100 employees on a work site, then does that, would it apply to me? And the answer that the Department of Labor gave, again, they're foreshadowing on what's going to be in the ETS, as they said, uh, no, it's going to be counted based on the entire organization. So even if you have only 10 employees per work site, if you've got more than 100 employees uh, organization-wide, then it would apply to you potentially. Um, another great question that came through the registration process is, will it apply to my re remote workers? This was a question that was also asked to the Department of Labor on that webinar, and their answer was no. Not if the remote worker is purely remote, remote and they don't actually enter the workplace, they don't have any physical interaction with your other employees, then um, this requirement for them to get vaccinated or submit to weekly um, testing would not apply to them. This is what the department no, that, was. Um, To clarify on that one, that it, it seemed to me that that meant that they were going to be covered uh, for employees that were hybrid as well, though. So it's kind of like if they never came into the workplace, like for instance, the workplace is in Atlanta and they live in to Toledo, right? So it wouldn't, they wouldn't be part of that. But if they lived in Atlanta and they came in once a week or twice a week, they would be part of that hundred, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So it's we're gonna... seeing a lot of our clients right now, especially our small businesses, they're like, well, they're not all back yet, but they will be. Um, you know, I don't know that you can thread that needle if they really are planning on coming in even a day a week. Absolutely. And keep in mind, we've got the action plan that President Biden released, very little information there. We've got this webinar that the Department of Labor did where they clarified a few things. We also know what they've done in these past, ET or, well, there's only been one other ETS recently, which was the healthcare one. We know what they've done there. There's been some executive orders where President Biden has uh, applied some vaccination requirements to federal workers. So that's really the information we have to go on to, tr to try to predict or understand what's going to be in this ETS. Um, but based on what the Department of Labor said, it does appear that if there is any chance or opportunity or requirement that that remote worker might step into uh, your office, then they would have to go through the same requirements as every everybody else. Okay. So what, what are we likely going to see in this ETS? Again, based on those, th that information that we have today and what we have access to, likely a written COVID-19 plan, a specific plan that implements, you know, all the things that you're doing to comply with the ETS. Um, a good question on that. There was a great question in the registration process where they asked, you know, is this something that, you know, the government has done before? They're like directing, 
you know, an employer to take certain actions. Now the employer has to do, and then the next question in the registration process was, you know, if they don't, if they violate that, can they get unemployment? Really awesome questions. Understand the government has done this before. It's called Title VII. It's all of your like, you know, labor and employment laws. These are federal laws and they specifically say to private employers, you cannot discriminate on the basis of these protected classes. The reason you can't discriminate based on those protected classes is because there's a federal law that says you can't do it, right? And whatever the federal law in the court system later said is a protected class, right, then applies to And what do employers do? They create a written policy, right? They've got their equal employment opportunity policy. And what happens if an employee violates that policy? Well, they get fired or terminated or some other adverse. And can they get unemployment benefits? Absolutely not. So I don't see that it's going to be any different here. It's the government saying, this is something that you have to do. Um, you're going to put a policy in place. If they violate the policy, then you need to make sure your policy gives them notice of what the consequences of that are. And as long as you're consistent with your policy, then you can take those adverse consequences and that'll protect you against um, somebody receiving unemployment benefits as a consequence. Understand though, the Department of Labor, this ETS will likely not deal with those liability issues um, and how to protect the lawyer, uh, the employer against liability. But again, you know, they're not gonna necessarily put in whether you can terminate people or what adverse action you can take, but you can always, as long as you gave your employer employees notice through your policy, you can always take um, the adverse actions that you notified them of and they're presumed to have notice of that. Um, again, different states have different labor laws. So you have to make sure that you're complying with all those states as well. So these are likely the things that you're gonna see in the ETS based on those other things. Let's go, go ahead and go to the next slide, Mallory. And I'm gonna start dancing because I don't really know what's on the next slide. Okay, there we go. So the Department of Labor provides employers with, um, are required to pay employees for time spent waiting and receiving medical attention. Um, that includes COVID-19, will likely include COVID-19 testing. Um, during working hours under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So even now, the Department of Labor has said under the Fair Labor Standards Act, if you make something a condition of employment, then that might trigger the obligation to pay time off. Um, we don't know what the penalties are going to be. It's kind of foreshadowed that it could be up to $4,000, about $14,000 per violation. Um, they will likely issue this ETS in the next several weeks. We do not have an exact date, but the Department of Labor said on September 10th that it's in the coming weeks. Um, based on the deadline they gave federal workers, private employers will likely have 75 days to comply. Again, we don't know. We haven't seen the ETS. And the 22 states, if you're in one of those states and you have a state-run OSHA program, um, this ETS will require those state-run programs to implement their own ETS within 15 to 30 days. And that ETS must be just as effective. Well, and, this and, okay, let's stop there. I've had a lot of... Um... A lot of my clients asked me the question because I think when they heard the president speak, they just assumed that, OK, this is like an executive order, like it's out like today. Um, but I mean, the earliest this thing could be implemented and you as the CEO have to figure this out. I mean, first, the ETS has to be issued and there is no indication that that's going to happen today. Right. But then once it's issued, there is this waiting period. So. If you're sitting here saying, I have to make this decision today and I have to decide exactly what we're doing, yes, I think you need to start formulating that idea. But it also doesn't mean that you have to, we're, we're, you are not going to be in a place that by next Monday, you're going to have to put this thing in place and all your people are going to have to get vaccinated. I mean, we're not there. You're not there. No. I mean, we're not there. So this is, this is a planning period. This isn't a panic period at this point. That's correct. And some other things could happen. You know, in that 70 day period, a, the Court of Appeals could stay the ETS and not allow it to go into effect at all. Right. And in that case, you wouldn't have to comply with it until it got through the court system. That is um, a judicial mechanism that is available to the Court of Appeals that could be used um, if the Court of Appeals feels that there is no grave danger or feels like there's not sufficient evidence to show that there's a grave danger. So and again, that grave danger has to be people have are dying. And if you don't put the ETS in place, people will die. We're going to go slightly a little bit longer um, just to get through the rest of the material and we'll move on to the next section. So emergency use authorization. Uh, just real quick, the FDA um, approved the first 
vaccine, which was Modera in August. The other vaccines are still being available under the emergency use authorization of the FDA. Um, there was some confusion around there because under those, the e, under the emergency use authorization, the FDA is required to allow people to either accept or refuse the vaccine. This has been considered a disclosure requirement. There's a lot of e e illegal experts that have commented on this. Essentially what they've said is just because you have to disclose that to an employee and give them the option doesn't mean that you can't take adverse action based on the decision that they make, whether they refuse or accept. So the short of it is yes. Wait a minute, wasn't the Pfizer the one that was approved? Not it was, huh? Yes, it was Pfizer. I just wanted to uh, keep you guys sharp. And they have a new name. It's called, uh, com I can't say it. It's commentary or commentary or something like that. They've got some confusing name, which will yep. likely take me several months to, uh, to be able to pronounce. But yes, Pfizer. Um, and then Moderna, Moderna and um, I think it's Janssen is the other one, are still available through the emergency use authorization. So your kids who are 12 years or older, they are receiving that through the emergency use authorization with Moderna because that has been allowed for that. The Pfizer one is still 18 years and older. It's only been approved by the FDA for 18 years and older. Uh, so that might be some issues with um, minors who are permitted to work. So just real quick, so we understand kind of the reasonable accommodation. So none of these, all these laws under the EEOC, that the EEOC enforces, the American Disabilities Act, Title VII, are still going to be enforced. And so there's a, a kind of a complex interchange between what's happening and if this ETS becomes effective and how you're going to comply with these different labor laws. So you do have to make reasonable accommodations if the employee can show that a vaccination shot would worsen his or her medical condition or if it would pose a danger to her health. Great question on the registration form. Um, how do I show that? Uh, well, in that case, that would be uh, easier because it would simply be a form. It's what most employers do. You are not a medical professional. So you would, you would have that employee take that form to a medical professional, to a doctor who would then basically check a box that says, yes, taking the vaccine would worsen their medical condition. And that's all you want to know. You have to be very careful about what medical information you collect. Um, and all you really want to know is that they have a doctor and they verify that says that, that they they uh, that it would worsen their condition or pose a risk to their health. And again, oh, I see something recently in the last couple of days that said that they were really going to clamp down on that because there were people that were issuing those check boxes fairly willy nilly. And so that was one thing they were going to, the administration was going to cut, try to crack down on. Did I see that? Um, that might, I have not seen that, but the EEOC could certainly put out some clarification on existing regulations um, since they are the agency that is, 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 is enforcing this. And in putting that out, they could uh, tighten up the definition of what a disability is. And then in doing that could make it less easy, so to speak, for an employee to be able to uh, use that. Um, and so that, those are some things that the EEOC can do. The other one is, uh, is uh, firmly held religious beliefs. Again, you are not some, you know, when you're, when you're making or dealing with that request, you are not in a position to determine whether their, you know, religion is legitimate or not legitimate. All, you, you are permitted to ask questions. The questions that you're gonna be asking are, you know, um, when, did you, when did you obtain this firmly held religious belief? If they said that they obtained it like right before this ETS came out, then that might be, constitute a personal opinion. If, you know, in asking questions, they say, you know, this, I just don't agree with these things. That could constitute personal opinions and the United States Supreme Court has ruled on that. And they said anything that's really a personal opinion isn't a firmly held religious belief and that's not a sufficient accommodation. Now, if you end up making an accommodation, right, this gets tricky because you're not, you don't have to make an accommodation that you determine would cause an undue hardship to your organization or would put other people in danger. And so you would look at, is there reasonable accommodations available? The EEOC recommends an interactive process. You know, can that worker go purely remote and not have access to your workplace at all? Can you adjust their schedule so that they're not in direct access with other workers? 
Um, these are things that you can do. I got a few smiles. You see a few smiles. We have a little bit of fun, right? These are some things that you can do um, as possible uh, reasonable accommodations um, that you can make. So but that, we don't want to do any of that. We don't have to do any of that right now. No. There's enough chance that this thing actually won't pass or will be a far off that, right, that we don't have to go ask our employees whether they, you know, we're going to make them get this vaccine and they need to tell us whether they have one of these two exemptions, like, right today. Because not I'm a little concerned that we're going to, our employers are going to do that without a whole lot of knowledge and could possibly ask the wrong questions and therefore be subject to some sort of litigation because they've now infringed on HIPAA or something like that. Yeah, so well, before you do that, we need to really know what we're supposed to ask, right? Yeah, there are a lot of legal pitfalls. You start asking like, hey, does your family member have, you know, uh, special situations that if they got, you know, uh, they, 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 they were to receive COVID that they could possibly die or something like that. You start getting to family member medical information, you are potentially likely violating you know, Gina, there's all kinds of uh, pitfalls there as you, you get into these things, which is why you really need to have good professionals around you who are helping you before this. So just some other things, you know, cannot require antibody testing. The EOC's comment on this, that has to do with whether you've received COVID in the past, uh, viral tests are permitted. Um, you uh, can inquire about COVID-19 symptoms, that is okay. Um, whether you can acquire that of remote workers that are purely remote, we don't know. Uh, must continue to keep all information obtained from the employee confidential, separate from their personnel file, the same the way you deal with medical information under the FLSA today. Uh, again, asking about family members um, and then how you screen job candidates. People might say, well, everyone is vaccinated or, you know, well, you've got to be careful because when you're, when you're screening job candidates, um, if, you're, if you're doing something that prevents people from getting a job, that could also end up being a violation of one of these labor laws. Um, and you, there's what's called a conditional job offer. That's like a key line in the sand. Once you provide a conditional job offer, then you can get into further screening questions that have to do with COVID-19. But before you make that conditional job offer, you cannot get into any sort of screening questions around COVID-19. So that's all I've got for today um, with regards to the legal implications. What we want to turn to now is uh, our fireside chat with Cindy. So Cindy, you're up. And uh, real quick, want to mention that this is streaming on Facebook Live. Um, so you can let other people know about this if they want to tune in now. We will post this video on YouTube. Um, and again, send your questions in the chat. We'll try to answer them. If we're not able to answer them all, we'll send out an email after the webinar. All right, Cindy. So Peter Drucker, famous for saying, culture eat strategy for breakfast. I would imagine with all this buzz, COVID-19, I could hear him saying right now from his grave, culture eats COVID for breakfast. So love to hear your general thoughts on the interplay between dealing with COVID-19 and its variants and maintaining a positive and productive culture. Yeah, so um, I think the thing that we need to remember, remember I'm coming at it from an HR perspective, not from a legal perspective. Hopefully I'll know a little bit of both, but um, mine is more of a, I kind of HR exists to make sure that we provide great work environments for our people and we create policies and procedures, not only so that they feel safe, but they feel like they're flourishing and that they're in a place where they want to work. Right. And we are in a, the, one of the largest candidate markets I have ever seen in my life. Um, meaning that when we give job offers to people, cause we're a staffing and recruiting firm, they likely will get two or three other offers in that same week. So it is, especially there's two types of positions, low availability positions and high availability positions. And there are so many low availability positions right now that um, if you call me and tell me, for example, you want a controller, um, I'm gonna tell you that you have to pay a lot for a controller right now because there's not many controllers that are actually out of work that are good right? Because the unemployment rate, especially in the state of Georgia, is so low. So why do I bring that up in the middle of this COVID-19 mandate discussion? Because we need to make sure that everything we do um, through our, of course, we want to be legally on the right side of the world, but we want to make sure everything we do is through that lens of we want to keep our best employees, 
right? We want to make sure that the staff that we want stays with us, right? So can we enact things that are legal? Yes. Should we? That's a decision that you have to make within your company because we have to make some decisions on not only what our personal feelings are on things, what the law is, but then we also have to decide if we want to keep our employees and keep them happy, what will that be that makes that happen? If we if let's say I get a lot of questions, you know, we're talking about now the employers that are over 100, right, that may have this mandate. We also have employers, many of my employers are under 100. And so they may not have the mandate, but do they go along and do it with it or do they not? Right. And so for some, for, you know, a lot of reasons, you know, maybe, maybe you're of the persuasion as the CEO that you believe that people want safety more than they want um, to make a choice, right? So they don't want to come to wor your workplace unless everybody's vaccinated. And so you're making a choice to make vaccines mandated. Okay, that's, that's a fine decision, right? Or you may be of the, the persuasion that says, hey, I might have an opportunity to gain if this thing goes through. And if you have to either test weekly or have um, a vaccine, if you work for a company over 100 employees, I may have if I don't require those things, I may have an option to have access to a lot of candidates that may be leaving those employers because maybe they don't wanna be vaccinated. So all of a sudden I may have, as a small business owner under 100, I may have an opportunity to grab a bunch of employees um, and candidates that I no might normally not be able to grab because I'm providing some flexibility that the ones over 100 can't provide. So again, is that the right thing to do? It could be. Um, again, you just have to look at what's right for your, your group of people in light of the mandate, right? Um, but what I'm cautious about is that we don't wanna tick off a large group of our employees and all of a sudden you're gonna call me and say, I need to replace half my staff. So what I'm telling my clients to do is to be very cautious right now before you make any decisions. Right. We don't want to go ahead and, and say, well, you know, Biden came out and said this. So this is what we're doing, because there's a lot of stuff that can happen, like Jonathan was talking about, within the next month or two that will probably make things a little bit more clear about what you have to do or what you can do. Right. And so for us to come out and make this huge declaration of what's happening without waiting until some of the some of the things fall out, I think would be a huge mistake um, because we also don't want to tell our employees one thing one day and then totally switch our policy the next day, right? Because something else came out in the news. So as a, as a person who's an HR person, we wanna make sure that our employees feel safe. They feel like we're making good decisions. They feel like we're listening to the proper authorities and that we're not changing our minds a lot right? Because that's how they feel like, wow, this is a good employer. So you need to be very cautious with that. Um, I would say that if you are currently an employer that is 100% virtual, um, one year, pro and, and maybe you weren't before, right? So you went 100% virtual in COVID, which we're hearing a lot about right now. You are probably starting to experience some culture issues, right? So um, I, I run an entirely virtual company, but it's always been virtual. And culture is hard to keep in a, in a virtual company. It just is. In fact, just so that you know, a couple different statistics that you might want to think about as you think about these policies and what you might want to do. 41% um, of people in America in management positions, or um, we'll call them non-first um, level wage positions, are looking for a job outside their company. 41%. Largest number I've ever heard in the history of me looking at these statistics. So that means four out of 10 people are looking for a new job right now, not just within their company as a promotion, but outside of their company. That should scare you. Or, you know, you may be the employers that are like, you know, we're so awesome that that's not happening to us, it's happening to all of our competitors and that would be awesome. But make sure that you know that that is happening because it's, it's um, the only number I've heard before that was 8%. So eight and 41% are certainly different. The other interesting percentage is that um, there were some studies done before the pandemic, and it talked about how 12 percent, um, there was 12 percent more productivity when you worked from home a day or two a week 
But if you worked from home five days a week, there was 40% less employee engagement. And when there's less employee engagement, it means that people are going to quit, right? Or it's going to be harder to keep them. So as you're making decisions on, okay, well, I'm just going to stay as an entirely virtual workplace, right? Because with all these rules, I'd rather not engage. Recognize that to not engage and to keep your team out there and not coming back into the workplace at all is also hazardous. Right. Because what we're seeing is that a lot of our employers are now competing if they're going 100 percent virtual and they used to have the great office with the lunches that were brought in. You know, you could bring your dogs to work. You had the great environment. And then all of a sudden they went virtual. We're seeing some attrition because now they're competing against the companies from California, especially in the tech space. Right. Because if I don't have my best friend that I'm working with and I don't go in and go to lunch with everybody every day, I'm just going to take the one with the highest dollar. Right. So you could have some issues if you choose to do the remote work um, just to get around the mandate if it happens. So a few things there. Um, it's one of the things kind of going back to like, let's take your time and prepare. What a lot of employers did with the whole during COVID is they sent surveys out to ask about remote work. Mm -hmm. Right? Do you prefer? So instead of making a decision on what model they were going to do, whether they were going to do a hybrid model or they're going to stay fully remote, they sent out a survey and said, "What do you prefer?" I could imagine and this would need to be carefully crafted with your HR professional, but you could ask a question: What would make you feel safe at the workplace? Right? And one of those questions might be a fully, fully vaccinated, um, you know, work staff, and you can see where your employees kind of stand on that without getting into checking vaccination status or getting into specifically identifiable information with your employers. But just to, employees, just to give you some good information, what, what are your thoughts on maybe uh, a light survey like that, that's, you know, where you're collecting information confidentially and just gathering data that helps you make better decisions? Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I always say with surveys, whether they're like, you know, in-person surveying or whether they're these anonymous ones, unless you plan on doing something with it, don't survey it, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, don't ask somebody a question if you're not going to let everybody know what the answers are or what you're going to do to implement it. So if you already have in your head what you're going to do on this, and then you're like, well, I'm just going to ask him to find out. And then, you know, you, you're not going to change anything, then just don't bother, right? But yeah, I, I would ask him. I also think that Sometimes we ask employees questions that we have, we know more um, than they do on what we need to do to get the job done. Like, for example, if you have the under 100 employees, you may have half your employees that really want everybody to get vaccinated, but you understand that there's a good way that you could get more computer programmers and you could take them away from the big companies if you don't require that. So mm -hmm. even though they may want that for the good of the company, and staying in business and, you know, so, you know, it's not all based on what an employee feels. It also, oftentimes is also based on strategy. So I don't know. I, I think that's, you could do either, but there's some strategy I think associated with this, especially if the mandate goes through and especially if you're a smaller company. So another thing that it just something I think about, like 41% are looking for a job, right? And so you'll hear, you'll hear employers say, man, there's not enough talent. Right, I don't have enough talent, but really, the the talent's there, right? Because that talent's going somewhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I almost think that employers need to reframe the question a little differently. Like, what what am I doing differently than what everybody else is doing in order to attract the right talent? Like if, yeah, if we call it. Yeah, at our company, we call it a recruitment marketing strategy. What that means is that like, if you come to us and say, hey, Cindy, I want you to find us an HR person. You know, we're gonna ask you a ton of questions and a lot of them are gonna be like, why would I work for you? Like, why do you work there? Like, can I talk to your best employee that's the most one that is, shares the vision of the company for 10 minutes? Because I need to know what the secret sauce is. Like, why did, you know, what are the things? What are the levers that people work there? Is it because you have higher pay? Is it because you have incredible benefits? Do you give six weeks of vacation? I mean, what is it that makes you, so I can, my recruiters can sell your company to the candidate. Because if they're gonna get two or three more offers in the same week, I got to say, they're different because of this, this, and this. You should take this job and leave your current employer because they're going to offer you this, this, and this, 
right? So I've got to give you, I've got to create that recruitment marketing strategy these days because I'd have to represent you as my employer, right, to these candidates. And so, man, if I ask you the question as the CEO or the HR person, like, what's different? Like, what am I going to sell you out there? Like, I don't know. Okay, well, we better find that out first or we can't really recruit for you. Not in this market. Five years ago, yes, this market now, right? So real quick, what are, what's talent telling you? Are they at, so they, I know talent was asking about remote work policies, right? That became a big thing that talent was asking about in looking for jobs. Like what is their remote policy? You know, can I work remotely? A lot of talent's looking specifically for that. Are they asking questions right now about vaccination policies? You know, we're having to ask questions. We have clients that have created vaccination policies that are already in place before the mandate. Mm -hmm. right? And so they won't even let them come interview unless they're vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're in a, yes, that's happening. In fact, we just had a job that we posted and it was for um, for a position with, them, with, with, with one of our clients that we always, you know, post for. But what we added this time was that it were vaccine was required for this company. And we have 25 people applying for a job that we normally would have had 200 people applying for. So I don't know if it's that or maybe it's the week and it's raining or whatever it is, but um, it did concern us because it does, you know, when you have this, you know, we always talk about how do you get the biggest pool of candidates, right? And so you have this big pool, you know, everything out there. And then when you say, hey, you know, we need people that um, have college degrees. It makes it go a little smaller. And we need people that have had 10 years of experience in their jobs and it goes a little smaller. But then when you add, we need somebody who has a vaccine and or definitely is going to take a vaccine, then it just makes your pool smaller, mm -hmm. right? Because if we've got only what, 58% of the country or something like that that have vaccines, that means you're decreasing your pool of candidates possibly by 42%. So again, um, it's going to decrease our pool of candidates. And right. so, you know, that's the, that's not the, you know, you got to worry about retention. You know, if we enact these policies, we may tick off 42% of our employees. And if we, we also have to worry about attraction, right? Is it going to decrease the pool so much that we're not going to find great candidates? Uh, yeah, my only remark is make sure you're not doing anything too fast. Wise counsel, wise counsel, wise counsel. I'm glad for a free call. Uh, you know, I mean, just where you make mistakes is panicking over stuff that comes out from the government before it's baked. So we don't want to have to retract anything. Make sure you know what you're doing before you do it. Don't roll something out quickly. I, I was at a group meeting the other day with a bunch of CEOs and they're like, I'm going to roll something out to my, you know, all my employees tomorrow on this. I'm like, okay, that's a bad idea. Like you need to really research it after you hear about it and make some decisions because what you don't want to do, like I said earlier, is just retract something once you set it out there. Um, because this is pretty heady stuff, right? This isn't just, you know, I understand he was talking about Title VII and about we don't want to discriminate against people, right? But this is, there is some really strong feelings out there about people in their health care and people in putting shots in their bodies. And so I know we all have different politics around that and different thoughts around it, but it's not, in my mind, as easy for our employees as say, let's not discriminate against people, right? Because it's, it's very personal because it impacts my body, right? So again, know that because the word empathy is not in most CEOs' um, vocabularies. And we need to make sure we have empathy on this because we're going to look back on this time as we're CEOs of companies or HR people, and people are going to make a decision whether or not they want to work for us based on how we handled things and how empathetic we were and how we led them through this. So let's make careful decisions um, that are wise and thoughtful and empathetic um, because our future staff of tomorrow is looking at how we handled all of these things today. And to sort of piggyback on what you're saying, Cindy, we all want that rock star talent. We all want that talent that's like, 
you know, like what Jim Collins describes, self-discipline with discipline to action, you know, and if you took like your top of the top, your best talent, they're going to have different views on this. And what that should tell you is that their views have nothing to do with whether they're a star performer within your organization. That's right. So making sure that you're focused on, I want star performers. If you make it about personal views and your messaging becomes about personal views and there's lots of opinions in there and it's very political, you know, you're putting yourself at risk of losing those star performers, performers who could actually help move your business forward and be successful um, because you're bringing politics into it. So yeah, and I just have to add one thing to that, Jonathan, is that I think um, it's very easy for us, especially in the climate today, to think that our opinion is the right one and everybody else is not right, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so if we take that tact as the leaders of our company and not understand that very smart people might have a different opinion as us, um, I think, you know, maybe we won't keep that top talent or we won't get that top talent because they'll recognize that we have an agenda. So whichever way it is, right? So again, that empathy, that understanding, that kindness and, and speaking kindly to people, even if they don't hold your same um, viewpoint on things, I think those are going to be the things that we, we continue to be known for as employers. Absolutely. Cindy, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jonathan Page. I hope everyone received a value-packed webinar. Our next walk webinar will be how to retain talent in today's market. We're going to have Cindy back with us for that one. It'll be October 18th, 2021 from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And again, if you found this to be valuable, please let other people know. The chat's going to remain open even after 2 o'clock. So you're welcome to put any um, specific topics you would like us to cover in that webinar or in future webinars. We really want to make sure we're doing this on a regular basis and providing a ton of value. So thank you, everybody. Have an awesome Monday. Thank you for joining Have us for this webinar. Bye.